Well, if you would, take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Philippians in the New Testament, and I want you to find chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. We are entering into a new season. We're approaching the fall season. For some, already consider fall here as football is beginning. The high schools have had their jamboree this uh, last weekend. We have many things happening. Kids are going back to school, uh, and they've entered into the fall semester. Many of you are planning your calendar for all the fall activities you're going to do. All the festivals and the pumpkin patches and all the stuff that you get excited about. Some of you, you're, you're, you're waiting for the the fall drinks at Panera and Starbucks to come out so you can rush down there and get you a pumpkin latte or something like it. And so here we are with a season that is upon us. And the thing about new seasons are that they can cause distractions in our lives. What I want to encourage us to do today is to refocus as we enter into a new season. Instead of allowing the things of this world to distract us away from the main thing, I want to encourage you today to reorient yourself and to refocus your mind upon the main thing. The one thing, the big thing, the most important thing. I want you to be able today to leave here knowing how important it is for you to focus on the goal that is set out before you. Let's look at this in Philippians chapter 3 starting in verse 12. And here Paul says, Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. We see Paul, he's talking about, there. there's evidently some goal out there. And the apostle Paul says, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going towards this goal. He says, but I have not reached it yet. Before I go any further, I want you to know there is a goal set out before you that God has placed before you And I can tell you confidently, just as Paul said, you have not reached the goal. You've not reached it. He says, but I'm going after that goal. He says in verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Distractions cause us to lose focus on the goal. And there are distractions coming your way right now that would keep you from pursuing the goal that God has for you. Now, what is that goal? The goal is the same for every one of us. Now, it might play out a little little bit differently, It might look a little bit differently in each of our lives, but God has the same goal for you and me that he had for the Apostle Paul. And here's what that goal is. In this life, God calls us to move closer to Jesus. That is the goal. Every single day, we are to move closer to Jesus. We're to draw closer to Jesus. So if you think of a goal, you can think about an aim or a target. And your aim in life, Every day, this year, this season, this fall, should be in spite of all of the the distractions to work through those things and keep moving closer to Jesus, to come closer to Him. See, Jesus, He is perfect, and God is calling us to draw close to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we ask God that as we consider this passage of scripture that you would help us understand our need to to pursue you lord and to pursue christ as our savior 
and to pursue you, Jesus, as you do a great work in us, causing us to be more and more like Christ every single day. Lord, help us to see the goal and to move beyond the distractions, to move, keep moving forward towards you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. He says in verse 12, Paul says, he says, essentially, I'm not there yet. Kind of like your kids when you're traveling on vacation or heading somewhere and you, you get that um, statement over and over again. You get those questions, are we there yet? Are we there yet? When are we going to get there? Well, I'm going to answer the question at the end of this message when we're going to be there, okay? But here's the deal. Right now, we are not there. You are not there. I am not there. And Paul, when he is writing this, he says, I have not already reached the goal. I am not perfect. You see, we have a Savior who is perfect. As the kids are getting ready, those that are going to be in the New Believers class, my wife Chelsea is teaching it, and she was showing me some of the things that she's going to be going over with them in the first lesson. And so I was looking at that with her, and there was a theme that kept running through it, and it was the theme that, that God is perfect. He's perfect. He's sinless, and He is perfect. And, and here's the deal. We are not He's perfect, and we are not. We fall short of His standard. We fall short of the target that He has set out before us. What God calls us to is sinless perfection, yet we have sinned, and we are not perfect. And as long as we are here on this earth, we will continually fall short, and we will not live exactly how we need to live. But God says, every day you're here on this earth, my goal for you is for you to move closer to Jesus. For you to become more like Christ. For you to pursue Christ and His character and His competencies. That is, to, to know the things of God, to, 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 to do the things that, that you know Jesus wants you to do. And, and, and to not, not do things that He doesn't want you to do. You're to pursue Christ with complete abandon to be relentless in your pursuit of Jesus. You are not there yet. You have not reached him. You're not standing before him and looking him in the face. Yet he says, pursue me, pursue me. You're still going for that goal. You're trying to reach and take hold of the goal. No, Paul says, why, why are you trying to reach and take hold of that goal? Reach out, take a hold of it. Oh, if you look back at that verse 12, he says, I make every effort to take hold of it. Why? Because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. You see, you are trying to take hold of that goal because Christ has already taken hold of you. Now, don't lose me here. Don't lose me here. He says in Philippians chapter 1, you can flip over and look, verse 6, verse 6. Philippians 1, verse 6 says this, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says, flip over another page to chapter 2, verse 13. He says, for... It is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. In essence, here's what Paul is saying in all these places that we are reading. God is doing a work in you. You see, you are going after and pursuing Jesus because Jesus has already pursued and grabbed a hold of you. What, what you don't need to misunderstand here in this passage of Scripture is Paul is not saying that you are going to earn or achieve your salvation because that's impossible. You don't achieve salvation, you receive salvation. And Paul says in that chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am confident of this. What is he confident of? That he, that he, Christ, who he began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. See, God 
has begun a good work in you. And he, in verse in chapter 12, he who is in you, he is working in you so that he can work out of you those things that he is working in you. And part of his working in you so that you work out those things is that as you're working out those things, you are working them out in your pursuit of knowing him more. Of drawing closer to Him, moving closer to Jesus every single day. Let me say it again. You cannot achieve your salvation. You can only receive salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, He has pursued you. Jesus came here with a goal. And His goal was to purchase for you salvation so that by faith you could have salvation in Him. And he went all the way to the point of death, death even on the cross. And there he hung on the cross, he bled and he died. He took your sin upon himself and there he paid the penalty for your sin, the penalty for my sin. He defeated sin and death on the cross and through his burial and his resurrection because he is alive. And he came to life on that third day being raised from the dead. And he offers you the gift of salvation. You can't achieve that salvation, you only receive it. Because he's offered it to you, and he says you just receive it by faith, believing in me. You see, distractions can keep you from doing the things that move you closer to Jesus. What are some of those things that help move you closer to Jesus, that draw you closer to him as you walk with him daily? Well, a lot of them are simple things. They're things you may take for granted. One of, the, one of the great blessings that God has given us is the church. The church didn't come from, from you or me. The church came from God himself. He's established the church. You know he's given us the church to bless our lives. The church is to help move us closer to Jesus. See, one of the things we do in the church is we're able to, like we're doing this morning, corporately have fellowship with one another. We come together. We don't worship off alone by ourselves, alone all the time in isolation. No, we come together with a group, a body of believers, and we bring our voices together, we bring our hearts together, we bring our minds together, and we lift high the name of Jesus, and we say, God, we give you the first day of the week. We give you the morning of the first day of the week because we desperately need you. We desperately want to get close to you. We want to draw near to you, Jesus. You're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our of our resources, everything we have. That's why we, we give in the offering plate. We, we come here and we give you our very best, God, because we want to draw closer to you, Jesus. And so one of the ways that we can be distracted that can keep us moving closer to Jesus is we can allow the distraction in, in this world keep us from gathering for worship. And when you fail to gather for worship, you're not moving closer to Jesus at that moment. Because in the place of worship, that's where God wants you to be. He, 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 he wants you to spend time praying. You can allow the distractions of this world to prevent you from praying to God. As you pray, you move closer to Him. You draw near to Him. So you may just need to find a way to go plug your phone up somewhere in another room in the building of your house so you can get 10 minutes, 15, 20 of alone time with God praying. Because it might be that sometimes you try to pray, but you can't get beyond the first 10 seconds because... Any downtime you have, you've become so addicted to your phone, you pull it out and start looking at it. And you close it, and 10 seconds later, you pull it back out to see if anything's changed in the last 10 seconds. And and distractions can keep you from moving closer to Jesus, pursuing the goal. What's the goal? The goal is moving closer to Jesus. You're not there yet. You've not reached the goal, but every day you should be pursuing Him, Christ. 
Same thing with studying your Bible and having a quiet time. Or in serving others. These are the types of things that help move you closer to Jesus. And so what does, what does Paul say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13? He says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. He says, there's one thing I do. Now, in a world of distractions, what can help you a lot is instead of focusing on many things, hear what the Word of God says, which it says, make one thing your main objective. Make one thing your main focus. Now, that's easier said than done. My kids and your kids probably are like mine. You'll have a bag of candy. You'll have all different kinds of candies. Sometimes I'll, in fact, I did this last night to my son. I opened up that bag of candy because I wanted a couple pieces, and he was saying, there, I was like, hey, pick one, pick one piece out. Well, that was a much more difficult task than I originally thought it was going to be. Because when there's a lot of things to choose from, it can be difficult to just choose one thing. There's many things right now for you to choose from. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to go? What are you going to spend your time on? What are you going to do? And you can do those things. But are you going to do those things and take away from the one thing that you should be focused on? You see, in a world of many things... Don't abandon the one thing, pursuing Christ. When you get the one thing right, when you get pursuing Jesus every single day right, hear me, all those other things are going to fall into place. They will fall into place if you will put first Christ and pursuing Him daily. I was... And I'll share this with some of you if, if you want more information on this after the service. I'll try to figure out how to share this with you. But my brother-in-law is at a church down in Georgia as a minister there. And they had a thing called the Day of Champions last Sunday. And on that Sunday, they had a famous athlete come in. And he took about 50 minutes and shared with the church his heart in kind of a question-answer time. He's a believer his name is David Pollock. David Pollock was a three-time All-American for the University of Georgia football. He then went on and played in the NFL. But then he had a tragedy happen. He says that tragedy when he was paralyzed in a game was the best thing that ever happened to him. He was working for college game day. Some of you have loved watching that show for years and years. He was working for college game day. He's a strong believer. He's a high-energy guy. And... Uh, ESPN canned him this year, so he won't be back. But he's looking at this as, a, as an opportunity where he can do other things that he loves. And one of those things is sharing his faith and his insights into, into walking with God and, and being an athlete and doing those things, being a father. And he was there, and as he was talking to the audience, and there were football players, and there were just people at the church there that day, uh, he, he, he began to share about the influence that he has as a father. And he shared, reminded me of the influence we have as parents, as a father or, or as a mother or as a, as a grandparent. And, and he was talking about little league sports or, or just sports in general with your kids. And he said, he said people think that his son, who's going to be a freshman, he might start on his high school team. He said, he said, People wonder, what do I do to help him? He, he said, do I, do I sit and watch game film with him? He said, I, I don't watch game film with him. He said, the reason I don't watch game film with him is because I want to use my influence for something that really matters. 
Uh, that there's, there, there, there's, there's things that are more important. And he said, I've got this influence, but, but if I'm going to use this influence, I want to use this influence in somewhere that really is going to matter and make a difference. What really matters? What really matters is, is leading your family in their relationship with God. That's what matters. You see, that's being focused on the one thing. It's not that the other things are bad. It's not that you shouldn't go out and have fun. And play sports and have your kids in sports and cheer them on. But you need to remember what the most important thing is. The one thing. The goal getting closer to Jesus and pursuing him with all your might. He says, here's what he says. He says, here's what I do. I forget what is behind and I reach forward to what is ahead. In pursuing the goal of Christ, I encourage you, as Paul says here, forget what is behind. Do you know it's okay to forget things? It is. Sure, learn from your past. Learn from your past mistakes. But do not live in your past. Do not live in your past mistakes. Do not live in your past failures. Do not live in your past sins. I got good news for you today. If you've come to God and you've asked Him for forgiveness, He doesn't hold your past against you. The Bible says that God forgives and he forgets. And if God forgives you and he forgets about the sin that you've committed against him, he's saying to you, it's okay to move past it. Now the enemy, the devil, he's going to do all he can to keep bringing those past failures up. He's going to keep bringing those sins back up because he wants to stop you in your tracks. He wants to keep you from moving forward. He wants you to live in the past. He wants you to hear that you're a failure and you can't go beyond where you're at. He wants you to think that you can't pursue Christ because of things you've done in the past. He wants you to think because you failed last year, you're going to fail this year. But what Paul says here is if you want to run victoriously towards the goal, what you got to do is you got to let go and you got to forget the past. You got to stop looking back. Past failures and past sins. I'm thankful to know in my life that all I have sinned so often. But God has forgiven me. He'll forgive you today. Doesn't matter what you've done. You might say, oh. You say, well, you're a preacher. You, you haven't done the kind of bad things I've done. Well, you, first off, you don't know. <laughs> Second thing is, there's nothing... That you've done. There's no sin you've committed so bad that the blood of Jesus can't wash away. And you can come and you can bring that sin before God. God says, I'm here with open arms ready to forgive you. He's done it all. And he just says, receive me by faith. Turn that sin over to me. Ask for forgiveness. And you will be forgiven. Not because I said it, but because that's what God says. So forget what's behind, but, but reach forward to what is ahead. Here this word, reaching forward to what is ahead, is a, it's actually an athletic term. Now, what it means is it means to overextend oneself. To stretch one's muscles to the limit. Uh, you think about a runner. In a runner, those Olympic sprinters, they're on the 100 meter dash, and 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 they are they are giving it their all. They are stretched out. They're not running like 
this. Every muscle and everything they have is leaning forward. And they are pushing. And they are pushing. Their neck is extended. Their head is extended. Their eyes are looking forward. They are straining forward with all they have in them. And that's what the Bible is saying for you and me. As you pursue Jesus, you don't do it on a nice leisurely stroll. You need to wake up every morning and say, I'm going to pursue Jesus today with all I have. I'm going to strain forward. I'm going to push my muscles to the limit. I'm going to leave it all out there as I pursue Jesus. In, I believe it's about 1959, there were two two runners that made history. One runner was John Landy. John Landy, well here they are, they're on the screen for you. You see in the front leading there, you see a man by the name of John Landy. The man behind him was Roger Bannister. And that year, both of these runners had done the unthinkable. They were the first ever that ran a mile under four minutes. And the world caught wind of these great runners. And now they were having a big race in Vancouver. And both John Landy and Roger Bannister were running and competing against one another. And it, it swept the world known as the Miracle Mile. The Miracle Mile of these two runners that could possibly run it in under four minutes. Landy had set the record earlier in the year. Put it back. Put it back, guys. Y'all are going too fast. Yeah, leave it up there. I'll tell you when to. Landy had set the record earlier in the year under four, under four minutes mile. Bannister came along, and, 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 and he set the record. And they go to race, and we have these great photographs here of the race. And as they were running, Landy was out ahead the whole way. He had a pretty good lead. And then, as they were getting towards the home stretch, and they hit that last turn, Bannister had begun to close the gap somewhat. And as he was closing the gap, Landy thought he was pretty much going to win this thing. But then Landy made a very critical mistake, caught on camera. You can go to the next picture. You can see Landy, for you, he's on the right side. As they were approaching the finish line, he took his eyes off the goal. And just for a split moment, he turned to his inside to look back to see how big of a lead he had on Bannister. And just as he began to turn back, and so our runners in here know, you, you, you got to stay forward. You got to stay focused. You got to stretch out with all your might. Anything that distracts you, it's going to slow you down. And for a moment in time, he had a distraction. His mind said, look the other way. He looked the other way. And that's all Bannister needed to beat him. And he came along beside him, and Bannister won the miracle mile. Friends, there's a goal out before us, and it's, it's Jesus. And he's the goal, and he's the finish line. And we got to get our eyes focused on him. We've got to not allow the distractions to pull us away. Uh, we've got to use, reach forward with all of our strength. We've got to overextend ourselves. We've got to strain forward with all we've got pursuing Him. It says in verse 14, it says, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. See, we are pursuing the prize of the goal of hitting the finish line and, and 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 what is that prize well when Paul was writing this there were olympic games the roman and greek olympic games 
And they would understand these runners and those that were competing. And the best athletes of that day would compete in these athletic games. And there would be a judge that would oversee the games. And when a competitor would get first place, they would have, just like we have today in the Olympics, they would have a podium. They would have a podium for the victor, for the champion. And that judge would call forward. He would call upward that victor. And that victor would go up and stand on the podium. And then they would come and they would place around their neck or on their head a crown and it was it was the victor's crown it was a wreath of laurel it was it was made of leaves and vines and other things and man that that victor would be so excited you could just imagine that crown wasn't coming off that man that man's head he would wear it around town and he would wear it and he'd be proud of it and everybody would look and say oh there's oh so and so that won the olympics and they were glorying in that crown but here's the one thing about that victor's crown that was given out in those olympic games eventually that crown would fade those leaves would wither off they would die and it would all go away it would turn to nothing and then that victor had nothing really to show for after that crown was gone but here's what the bible tells us paul says that i'm pursuing jesus as my goal until that day of the upward call. Just like that judge called forward the victor and put him up on that podium. One day Jesus is going to call us home. You say, when am I going to reach the prize? When am I going to hit the goal? That's when you're going to hit the goal. Is you're going to pursue Jesus relentlessly until your very last breath on this earth. And when God calls you home and Jesus brings you upward, there you are going to have reached the goal. You are going to receive the prize. What is the prize? Well, it's being in the presence of Jesus himself. Oh, when the icing on the cake is, Jesus says, and I have a crown for you. He says, I have a crown for you. Receive this crown that I give to you. Receive it. Put it on. And it's not like the crowns of this world. It's not like that victor's crown in the Olympics that fades. It says, this crown will never fade. It will never diminish. It will never go away. You see, Paul said in chapter 1, he said, I'm confident of this. I'm confident of this. That he who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion. And I'm telling you today, he will bring it to completion in your life. Here's what he says. Until that day, stay focused on the goal. Pursue him. Some of you, you've not entered the race yet. You've not given your life to Jesus Christ. You're not going to earn salvation. This message is not about you doing your very best and, and then hopefully that will equate to you being saved and one day going to heaven. No. He said, he who began a good work in you, he who began it, he will finish it. He that has taken hold, he's taken hold of you. Will, will you... Surrender your life to Jesus today and say, Jesus, take hold of me. Take hold of me. I turn from my sin and I trust in you. Help me pursue you as a believer. And one day, Jesus, call me home to be with you in heaven. Whatever sin you've committed in the past, by the grace and goodness of God, there is forgiveness. If you'll just give it to Jesus. Let's pray.